So I'm sitting here with Dr. Studer, who's the founding director of the Center for Dialogue and Analysis on North America at the Tech de Monterey campus. So I wanted to start off by asking you about the North American idea, in particular, in a world that is increasingly defined by technological networks, is a geographical unit like North America really relevant? It is very relevant, although not a lot of people realize this because we are very used to look at the world from a national perspective. But North America really, I mean, a lot of people think it was created or somewhat the integration, economic integration through trade and investment was created with the North American Free Trade Agreement. But the reason why I got interested many, many years ago in North America is because in Mexico, since the early 1980s, we talked about de facto integration between the U.S. and Mexico. And so at that time, you know, already Canada had a very long history of integration, economic integration with the United States, starting with the Auto Pact in 1965, and there on. So, I think that North America, it's much more than a lot of people would think because uh, we are integrated economically. If you look at the figures of trade, you know, of course, Canada and Mexico are the largest trading partners of the United States. But, but also there are a lot of linkages, you know, that come out of that trade because trade is not just in the abstract. I mean, you have companies, you know, having exchanges and benefiting from trade. So you have networks of production. And very few people know that you have North American industries, continental industries like the auto industry, electronics, computers. You look at how these linkages had created systems of productions that go across the border. And so, you know, North America is an economic reality increasingly. Of course, there are large parts of especially the U.S. economy that are not integrated to anything. But Mexico and Canada depend largely on the U.S. and the trade with the U.S. And a good part of some of the industries that are located in Mexico or in Canada are largely integrated. Just one last thought. Um, Mexico, uh, the U.S. and Canada are socially integrated. Uh, very few people want to accept this because we would prefer to say I'm American or Canadian or Mexican. But if you look at the um, exchanges of people, people going back and forth across the borders, you'll see that, you know, Canadians and Mexicans and uh, even Americans, you know, they, they cross the borders of uh, the three countries to, as tourists to visit or even to live. You know, very few people know that there are anywhere between a mil half a million or a million Americans living in Mexico as uh, retirees. And of course, you know, there are very few statistics, but you have increasingly a large number of Canadians who like to go to places like Puerto Vallarta for a number of months during the year. And of course, you know, the largest of the population that you can recognize very easily going across the borders is Mexican migrants, uh, increasingly coming to Canada, but, you know, the large ma majority staying in the United States. You have now uh, the population of Mexican origin in the United States is the largest minority. And so that tells you the degree to which, you know, parts of North America already exist, even though very few people acknowledge this because we are very much used to see at the world from the national lenses. Now if we were to move towards seeing a more continental lens on North America, who needs to be the leader? Should we depend on the United States, Canada, or Mexico? And is it going to come from the federal level or from subnational or private units? I think um, someone has to take the initiative, and I don't think the United States would be, you know, the one who would be leading uh, the effort. But we are not going to get anywhere if we don't have leadership from the United States. And uh, the I think the um, uh, most recent example is NAFTA again. You know, Mexico was. Uh, the one who took the initiative of actually proposing a free trade agreement uh, with the United States, and then Canada, who already had an agreement with the United States 
you know, came on board. I think uh, the United States cannot take the initiative uh, because it's such a large country with global interest. It would be very difficult for anyone, uh, anyone, any leader in uh, the White House to actually propose, you know, a, a region. Um, because a regional agreement, because of the difficulties for, you know, Washington to perceive themselves as not a global leader. But I think that um, that uh, having said this, you know, uh, Mexico or Canada should take the initiative, but the United States needs to lead because without the U.S. leadership, it would be very difficult to actually construct this idea of a North American community. I think it's going to be um, uh, the leadership of the three governments, but most importantly of societies, and especially the private sector. The private sector was instrumental in building NAFTA because even before NAFTA, they created the conditions for uh, the integration of industries, uh, and they saw a benefit, a competitive benefit, to actually create these transnational regional networks. And so that was pretty much um, the basis under which leadership from Mexico uh, you know, was able to promote uh, a North American free trade agreement. Um, and I think that uh, in, in the present times, you know, there are op good opportunities. When you look at the discussions about the green economy, for instance, you know, I think the private sector could see many advantages of building an agenda for North America on green businesses, for instance. Hmm. Now, I'm interested in the perspective from Mexican society. There is this explosive growth to the south of Mexico and what seems like pretty stagnant growth in the United States. Why look north when there's so much potential looking south? And are Mexicans actually interested in a trade with Canada when they could look south and well, um, it, is, uh, it is true that there is such a dynamism in Brazil or, well, especially Brazil. I think that's a, a regional powerhouse right now. But that growth is pretty much driven by the demand that comes from Asia, especially for natural resources. And so I think that both uh, Brazil and Mexico have very similar economies and they compete much more than they complement each other. And I think that uh, looking at, at Canada, you know, it's a country where has, first of all, uh, you know, high levels of income, purchasing power, but also complements very well the Mexican economy. There are many areas where there are opportunities for these two countries to benefit from um, strengthening their uh, bilateral relationship. I don't think uh, you would see, for instance, you know, um, uh, a lot of um, uh, growth in trade between Brazil and Mexico as much as you can see it between Canada and Mexico, for instance, in the area of, um, of automobiles, you know, because of the geographic proximity, it makes much more sense for Mexico and Canada to be building this North American auto industry that actually Mexico trying to, you know, um, promote trade with Brazil. Although it's true that Mexico has tried for many years, you know, to have a free trade agreement with Brazil. It has been impossible because the domestic industries in our countries oppose both in Brazil and in Mexico. And this doesn't happen in North America or in the case of the trade between uh, Canada and Mexico because we complement each other from an economic perspective.